Good afternoon. To begin our event, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire occupies the sacred and ancestral land of indigenous peoples. We honor the land of the Ojibwa and Dakota nations. Please take a moment to honor the land of the Ojibwa and Dakota nations. I'm Brewer Duran, the Dean of the College of Business here at UWEC. On behalf of the campus community, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. Thank you for joining us for the first event in the Central Bank Leadership Series hosted by the Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership, UW-Eau Claire College of Business, UW Oshkosh College of Business, and UW La Crosse College of Business Administration. The next event in the series will be held at UW Oshkosh and virtually on April 1st and is titled Getting Its Money's Worth, How Congress Governs the Fed. The final event in the series will be at UW La Crosse on April 5th. Please visit the Tommy Thompson Center web website for more information. The three campuses hosting these events are doing so because we are the governing partnership of the UW MBA Consortium a unique program that has put together many year, for many years now, running one of the highest rated online MBA programs in the country, and in fact, we are ranked as number nine nationally by US News and World Report. And so we were contacted by the Tommy Thompson Center to host these events, and we are very happy to do so. Now I'd like to invite Chancellor, Sch <laughs> Chancellor Schmidt to, take a, to share a few remarks, sorry. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean. Bur uh, <laughs> I'm going to mix up your name, Duran. It's only fair. So, uh, warm welcome to everybody here in the Ojibwe Ballroom, and for those of you who are joining us online, it is great to have you on our campus. I want to add my welcome to all of you for the first in a series of Central Leaders Central Bank's leadership programs, as mentioned earlier. Um, UW Eau Claire is honored to host the kickoff of this highly informative and timely topic. In particular, I'm so pleased that we're able to partner with the Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership to make this series possible. Today's program is a tremendous opportunity for our faculty, staff, and members of our community as well. Like the Thompson Center, we believe that the public good requires that leaders not only understand the challenges of our time, but also we need informed, active citizens who can help to shape the world around us. The Thompson Center takes seriously the need for ongoing public policy research and for bipartisan approaches to complex challenges, as well as the power to bring people together to accomplish positive change, as Tommy Thompson himself likes to do. It's been a true pleasure, by the way, having Tommy Thompson as the interim president of the UW system. It's a breath of fresh air, and I'd love to see him decide to run for office again. UW Eau Claire is delighted to partner with the center, and I hope this is just one of many opportunities to partner in the future. Today's four guest speakers bring an extraordinary range of expertise and wisdom to this conversation. While I can't pretend to be an expert on the Federal Reserve, I do know that the timing of this discussion could not have come at a better time. From the disruptions of the pandemic to today's global tensions, our understanding of our central banks and the impact they have has never been more vital. Panelists and guests, welcome to the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire and to what I know will be an engaged and spirited look at politics and the Fed. Again, welcome to UW-Eau Claire. Thank you, Chancellor Schmidt. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Alex Talk, director of the Tommy G. Thompson Center. Dr. Talk has served as the director since June 2021 and is also an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Welcome, Dr. Talk. Thank you, and thank you, Chancellor Schmidt, and everybody here at uh, Eau Claire. Uh, 
and uh, as well as Oshkosh and La Crosse who are, um, made this series possible. I'm really excited for this series. I'm really happy to be partnering uh, with these campuses to, to bring you this series. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the Thompson Center, beyond at least what was already mentioned, uh, our primary goal is to uh, carry on Governor Thompson's legacy and uh, facilitate uh, effective public leadership in Wisconsin and uh, throughout the country. Uh, we're based out of UW-Madison, but we work throughout all the campuses uh, and partner with campuses. And I want to uh, particularly highlight that because we are right now uh, soliciting uh, proposals for uh, both speaker grants and uh, research grants. So if you're uh, uh, affiliated with any part of the University of Wisconsin system, you have a research project or uh, you have a uh, speaker, you think, or a series of speakers, you might be good here. Please do apply. Um, I think, you know, the, the better we get, <laughs> the more involved uh, you could all be, the more you can uh, play a part in uh, helping decide what sort of speakers and events we have. I think the better the events are. So uh, for more information on that, as well as on our upcoming events, please go to our website, thompsoncenter.wisc.edu. And um, today's event on central banking, I think will really uh, be, uh, be a fascinating topic. Uh, when we started planning this, uh, I think we, we had in mind a number of existing issues, particularly uh, moves towards the Fed perhaps playing a more activist role. Since then, I think inflation uh, has become a significant news story uh, and obviously has central banking uh, at its heart. And more recently, the uh, situation in uh, Ukraine has also had a central banking element as the, uh, the Russian central bank uh, has been affected by the, uh, the crisis and the um, uh, um, sorry, uh, Western uh, restrictions in response to the uh, Russian invasion. So I think this really couldn't be a better time to be talking about all of this. Uh, so let me introduce uh, Victoria Guida. Victoria is an economics reporter at Politico, where she covers the Federal Reserve, the Treasury Department, and the broader economy. Uh, she graduated from the University of Missouri with a double major in journalism and political science, and she spent her Washington career uh, writing about bank regulations, monetary policy, and trade negotiations. So, there you go. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm really excited for this panel. As uh, was just laid out, this could not be a better time to be talking about politics and the Fed. Um, we are in a, you know, the Fed is always operating in a environment of heightened political intensity, but uh, over the last couple of years, the Fed has had to play a bigger role in our economic response to the pandemic, and uh, you know now we have the Ukraine invasion, and so there are all of these new interesting curveballs being thrown, and here we have an excellent panel to talk about, uh, you know, the the political dynamics around the Fed, how it's weathering them, and whether it is, you know, an independent and nonpartisan institution. So we have uh, Carol Abinder, who's a professor at Haverford University. We have uh, Charles Calamiris, who is a professor at Columbia University and a former chief economist at the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, and Christina Skinner, who is a professor at the Wharton School uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. So um, with that, I will hand it over to Carola Binder, and uh, she'll kick us off here. Great, thank you. So let me see. All right, hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be talking with you all about today's topic, central banks in the 21st century, politics in the Fed. 
Um, but as you see, I've added to the title, Central Banks in Not Just the 21st Century. Um, in fact, I'm going to take us about two centuries back in history to provide some context that I think is really useful for thinking about politics and the Fed today. Um, so my studies of monetary policy and economic history have led me to believe that the quest for a legitimate monetary system in American democracy began even before the revolution and has continued ever since. Um, in fact, episodes of inflation and deflation have played a really important role in shaping the uniquely American political system. Now, by many accounts, um, America now faces a crisis of democracy accompanied by the highest inflation in four decades and an erosion of trust in the Federal Reserve. These problems have prompted a wide variety of calls for reform. And I think that the historical context can help us better understand the implications of our responses to these challenges, um, not only for the economy, but for American democracy. I obviously can't give you this entire history in a 10 or 15 minute talk, so instead I'll just focus on one episode that I think is particularly interesting and relevant. This here is the second bank of the United States. It's in Philadelphia, where um, Haverford College also is. Um, so, of course, second bank implies that there was a first, and you're probably more familiar with the first bank, which was championed by Alexander Hamilton and the Federalist, and opposed most notably by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Well, the first bank had a 20-year charter from 1791 to 1811, but by 1811, um, Jefferson's party, the Democratic Republicans, were in power, and the bank's charter was not renewed. Um, so the timing of the first bank's demise was inconvenient, to say the least. In the War of 1812, um, a British naval blockade prevented farmers and manufacturers from exporting their goods and merchants from sailing the seas. This led to an economic downturn and disrupted the government's primary source of revenue from tariffs just when major expenditures were needed to fund the war. The Treasury Secretary and Congress eventually resorted to authorizing five issues of Treasury notes. The fifth included smaller de denomination non-interest bearing notes that circulated as a paper currency. The Treasury notes did not suffer from massive depreciation like the earlier continental currency, but by serving as bank reserves, they did contribute to monetary expansion and rising prices. There were some other sources of high inflation as well. The Napoleonic Wars, um, oh, this is the Treasury notes here. The Napoleonic Wars that had begun in 1803 had crippled the continental European economy, and reducing its agricultural output and leading to a larger market and higher prices for US agricultural goods. The eruption of Indonesia's Mount Tambora in 1815 led to summer snow in the Northern Hemisphere and further drove up grain prices. The result was a speculative land boom in the South and West of the United States. State banks, um, no longer regulated by the first bank, helped fuel speculation and inflation through their note issuance. Most suspended specie redemption of their notes in 1814. So during and after the war, Congress debated whether or not to reestablish a national bank. The Democratic Republicans, who had so vigorously opposed the first bank, became more supportive. They viewed the bank as one key component of their American system for economic development. And in April 16, Madison signed an act establishing the Second Bank of the United States with a 20-year charter. The Second Bank, like the first, was both a commercial bank and the government's fiscal agent. And reflecting Republican values, it had 25 branches spread throughout the expanding country with limited oversight from headquarters in Philadelphia. In the first two years, the bank had an expansionary influence on the already booming economy. William Jones, the first president was a political appointee with little experience in banking. His first major task was to convince the state banks to resume specie redemption in order to limit their exploding note issuance um, and reduce inflation. The state banks refused to resume re redem redemption until the bank finally agreed at the behest of the Treasury Secretary to accept their greatly depreciated notes at face value. This benefited the Treasury, which um, received most of its revenue as state bank notes, but it weakened the bank's balance sheet while allowing the state banks to continue to expand credit. Um, at the, so it was like continuing the speculation and the inflation. Jones also had trouble restraining the overissue of notes by the banks in the by the bank's southern and western branches, and there was also talk of embezzlement and scandals. 
So continued monetary and credit expansion and the reopening of trade with Britain led, um, led to um, imports to grow and or led to outflows of specie from, from the US. So the public soon came to lose confidence in the second bank's ability to continue specie payments. It was rapidly draining from the bank's vaults. And payments to foreign lenders for the Louisiana Purchase were coming due in the end of 1818, start of 1819, and they had to be made in specie. So as the repayment, bank, the repayment dates approached, the bank was compelled to reverse its expansionary policies, reduce its notes outstanding, um, reduce its holding of state bank notes, and increasing its specie reserves. The severe contraction of the, monetary, of, the mon of the money supply precipitated deflation and the Panic of 1819, which was a, a widespread economic and banking crisis. The second bank entered a new era when Nicholas Biddle, a Philadelphia banker and intellectual, became bank president in 1823. Under Biddle's leadership, the bank began more actively buying or selling state banknotes to loosen or tighten credit conditions. Biddle's financial savvy has been widely recognized. Biddle wrote that there is no one principle better understood by every officer in the bank than that he must abstain from politics. Keeping, out, keeping the bank out of politics was not that easy, though. The National Bank had not been a major issue in the 1828 presidential campaign, but it really quickly became one. In Jackson's first annual message to Congress, he claimed that the second bank had failed in the great end of establishing a uniform and sound currency. Jackson thought that the bank threatened democracy by putting too much power in the hands of private citizens without enough oversight from Congress, the president, and voters. In the face of Jackson's antagonism, Biddle launched a nationwide public opinion campaign, relying on branch officers, state bankers, confidential agents, and others to transmit pro-bank articles and pamphlets and petitions around the country. Biddle found support from the anti-Jacksonian party led by Senator Henry Clay of Kentucky. Clay convinced Biddle to seek an early recharter before the election of 1832, thinking the bank was popular enough that Jackson wouldn't risk vetoing a recharter before the election. But Clay bet wrong, and on July 10, 1832, Jackson did veto a bill that would, have, that would have extended the charter by 15 years. After Jackson then defeated Clay in the 1832 election, the bank war intensified. Jackson's drastic next step in September 1833 was to remove the government's deposits from the bank. Explaining this decision to his cabinet, Jackson argued that the bank had greatly, um, had gradually increased in strength from the days of its establishment. The question between it and the people is one of power, he said. The bank has by degrees obtained almost entire dominion over the circulating medium, and with it the power to increase or diminish the price of property and to levy taxes on the people in the shape of premiums and an interest to an amount only limited by the quantity of paper currency it is enabled to issue. Biddle responded to the withdrawal of deposits by raising interest rates and calling in bank loans. This was motivated in part by a desire to stockpile the bank's monetary reserves, but it was also an act of retaliation that Biddle hoped would lead Jackson to relent and restore the deposits to the bank. But as credit tightened and businesses failed, Biddle wrote to his colleagues that the ties of party allegiance can only be broken by the actual conviction of distress in the community. Nothing but the evidence of suffering will produce any effect in Congress. Businessmen blamed Jackson for removing the government's deposits and begged him to do something to relieve the financial strain. Jackson told one delegation, go to Nicholas Biddle. We have no money here, gentlemen. Biddle has all the money. He has millions of specie in his vaults at this moment lying idle, and yet you come to me. I tell you, gentlemen, it's all politics. But Biddle refused to let the bank be what he called cajoled from its duty by any small dribbling about relief to the country. The new Whig party controlled the Senate and censured Jackson in 1834 for his removal of the deposits. But public opinion turned on Biddle, who faced increasing criticism for his contractionary policies and was compelled to relax them. The economy improved substantially, apparently demonstrating that Biddle could and should have acted much sooner. Public opinion declined further when the bank's directors refused to cooperate with the committee sent by Congress to review the bank's books. Now, Jackson's victory over the bank was sealed when the same year, 
the Democrat-led House of Representatives voted not to recharter the bank. The Jacksonian Democratic Party is often described as espousing a laissez-faire economic outlook and preference for small government. But Jackson's battle against the bank should not be interpreted as evidence that he wanted a free market approach to money and banking. To the contrary, Jackson's hard money men hoped to nationalize the monetary system by suppressing the use of small bank notes and getting gold coins back into circulation, shifting control of the money supply from the private banking system to the federal government, which alone was authorized to coin money. So just to recap, several things led to the second bank's downfall. Poor management, scandals, and fraud in the early years certainly didn't help, and especially evidence that the bank was playing favorites in its credit policies. Biddle's massive public relations campaign um, and period of good management did start to salvage the bank's reputation, but public, public opinion really turned when Biddle essentially flexed his power in response to Jackson's withdrawal of the federal deposits. The facade of an independent, technocratic central banker came crashing down. It's not hard to see some parallels to recent years. The Fed's major changes in its communication strategy reflect its desperation to build and maintain good public opinion while it wields massive amounts of power and discretion. Some of the most damaging claims that the Fed faces are claims that it is picking winners and losers. At the heart of this claim is a challenge of the Fed's political legitimacy. Lucretia Reichlin warned in 2016 that to the populist bull, unelected technocrats wielding policies that have political and distributional consequences may as well be waving a red cape. Back then, Jackson and his supporters thought that their populist causes could best be served by destroying the National Bank. Now the populist bull, so to speak, is not out to destroy the Fed, but to work with it and through it. John Cochrane has written that trust and independence must be earned by evident competence and institutional restraint, but a popular movement wants all institutions of society to jump into the political and social goals of the moment, regardless of boring legalities. And, and this is, so this is what the Fed, um, this is what they're doing today. The, the graph on the right, that is from um, a paper that Christina and I have co-authored and it shows the share of working papers by Federal Reserve banks that are, that are touching these really controversial social and political issues. And in the Fed's, um, you know, in their, their websites and their other forms of communication with the public, they're increasingly, um, they're increasingly political and they're increasingly less focused on just the, the strict interpretation of their mandate. So in the longer run, this will only serve to politicize the Fed and undermine its credibility and legitimacy. The best solution I can think of is to have a more constrained, rule-based, and mandate-focused Federal Reserve. Thank you so much, that was fascinating. Um, next, Christina Skinner. Great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Okay, looks good. All right, so um, I'm going to talk to you about the political pursuits of the Fed. And what I want to do is take a step back and explain to you a little bit about why it is that politics is subtly, or not so subtly, depending on how you look at it, creeping back into the Federal Reserve. So to frame the conversation, I want you to ask yourself, quietly of course, um, what is a central bank and what is it supposed to do? A, a decade ago, at least, most people, many people, would find that a decently easy question to answer, right? The central bank is an institution that pursues monetary stability. And that's because, that, the reason that people think of the Fed that way is core to its identity, well, that's because that's the main job that Congress gave the Fed to do. The job is set out in the Federal Reserve Act, the piece of legislation that governs the Fed, along with the very specific policy tools that the Fed has to pursue that goal. But let's fast forward 109 years from the Fed's founding in 1913, and today central banks around the world, and especially the Fed, seem more so every day to be the answer to everything that has some economic valence. 
<coughs> the Fed and other leading central banks have been asked to solve climate change, to address inequality, to increase financial inclusion, and even now to take the lead in a matter of global security. But there is no statutory authority in law for the Fed to pursue these goals. Like all other administrative agencies, the Fed is an agent of Congress. It can only pursue the goals that Congress has asked it to do. It can only use its policy tools to pursue those specific goals that Congress has set out for it. But the notion has developed that we should just have the Fed solve these various problems because Congress is too slow or it's gridlocked. But this, I'll want to submit to you, is a direct manifestation of politics and populism pushing the central bank to expand into new extra-legal territories. Now, to the casual observer, this might seem pretty anodyne. If the Fed can accomplish all of these things, why not? But all too often, the costs of politicizing the central bank in this way are going unnoticed or overly discounted. So in my remarks today, I want to emphasize that politics and central banking do not usually mix well in the United States because of our unique legal structure around the Federal Reserve Act and our constitutional separation of power between the legislative and the executive branches. So to do that, to animate this, I'm going to give you three case studies, almost jumped the gun there. Um, I'm going to give you three case studies and have you consider the respective implications of having politics override the law of the Federal Reserve in each of these specific cases. And I'm going to cram a lot in here so I might speak a little quickly. So case study one is the Fed's new, and I put in square, scare quotes, financial stability mandate and how it's led the Fed to tackle climate change. Now, climate change is today the signature issue of the potential politicization of the Fed today, and here's how it's unfolding. After the global financial crisis, the Fed adopted a new role in regard to financial stability, so safeguarding the stability of the financial system overall. Now, this financial stability responsibility or mandate has given the Fed a tremendous amount of latitude to tackle new problems outside of the express mandates that are set out in the Federal Reserve Act, including now climate change. So discussion about central banks' role in tackling climate change really gathered steam around the world over the past 18 months. And the idea here is basically that central banks can influence the flow of capital toward green businesses and industries and corners of the financial markets and away from brown ones, in theory, spurring a transition to a lower carbon economy. But it's very difficult to characterize this objective as a monetary policy issue. Neither price stability nor employment have yet been visibly affected by climate change in a way that would legitimately trigger a Fed response. Nor has climate change induced a financial or an economic crisis that would, again, trigger the Fed's crisis-related monetary policy tools. So instead, central banks have been, including the Fed around the world, leaning on their financial stability responsibilities. And this can be in a really effective trigger to latch onto, because on the basis of any pronounced financial stability risk, the Fed could potentially shift incentives for bank lending, for example, by raising capital requirements to deter lending by banks to <coughs> brown industry. Or the Fed could introduce new, possibly vague supervisory requirements that also function as a carrot and a stick for bank lending decisions. But this is legally problematic. The uncomfortable but not often discussed truth is that the Fed doesn't have a formal financial stability mandate. Nowhere does the Federal Reserve Act or the Dodd-Frank Act that was created after the global financial crisis give the Fed a financial stability mandate. It's just sort of been inferred from the piece of legislation. Congress also didn't supply the Fed with a definition of financial stability or tell the Fed how to come up with one. It's also factually problematic. So labeling climate change as a financial stability risk really expands the definition of that term as we've been using it since the global financial crisis. If you have a look at banks' balance sheets, you would see that their exposure to heavy carbon producers is 5% of their total balance sheet or less. And they have two or three times the amount of equity capital to serve as a, as a buffer. So this is really different from the kind of financial stability risk associated with mortgage-backed securities and related products that the Dodd-Frank Act was expressly responding to. And there are three distinct rule of law problems in this scenario that I've just laid out for you 
where the Fed can take up new problems under the heading of a financial stability risk. For one, there's an end run around Congress, which is democratically illegitimate. Climate change poses questions that can be polarizing. There isn't yet a real social consensus about what the government, what the state should do about climate change, and certainly not about what the Fed should do about it. And if there were, Congress would write new laws giving the Fed new goals to tackle climate change, but it hasn't yet. Second, it suggests that when and if Congress, our most democratically responsive institution, is inert, the Fed can respond to fulfill the president's wishes, the items on the agenda of the executive branch in the interest of expedience. But there's a slippery slope we can slide down here. If you give the Fed power to identify new financial stability risks with no limitations on the hypothetical character of the risk or the time horizon, any number of things can fall into this bucket and it becomes ripe for political abuse. Three, there's arguably a constitutional issue here. So working structural transformations of the economy or undertaking policies that function like a tax on certain activities, those are fiscal functions that haven't been delegated to the Fed by Congress. So the second case study I want to discuss with you is fiscal dominance. So throughout history, we've seen that Fed independence from politics veers off track when the Treasury gains some foothold to pressure or influence the Fed. Now, this isn't true in every economy, which is interesting, but it is true in the US. And a bit of legal history for you makes this clear. So in the beginning, when the Fed was created, it wasn't actually totally independent from the Fed. When the Fed was created, Congress didn't really know what relationship these two public finance institutions were, should have with one another for optimal policy outcomes. So the Fed started out with a bit of a cozy relationship with the Treasury. But by 1935, this old world, Bank of England-inspired view of central banking had fallen away in recognition of the fact that politics would very likely muddy central banking. And central bankers' understanding of how monetary policy works really developed in the 1920s and 1930s. And Congress also then began to acknowledge the importance of separating monetary and fiscal functions through legal barriers. So at the time, the then governor of the Fed, Mariner Eccles, told Congress, if it is felt that the Federal Reserve Board is a political board and will be dominated by political expediency rather than the public interest in monetary policy, then certainly there should be some changes. So in the Banking Act of 1935, there were a few notable shifts that Congress took to distance the Fed from the Treasury. So first, the Fed actually used to be inside the Treasury building and it was moved. The Treasury Secretary also used to have an ex officio seat on the Fed board and he was kicked off. Um, the, banking off backed, the Banking Act also added a prohibition against debt financing that was added to Section 14B of the Federal Reserve Act that said that from then on, the Fed could only buy Treasury securities in the open market, not from the Treasury directly. Um, I seem to have lost my mouse here to advance the slides. That's okay. All right, so fast forward to World War II. So wartime made it difficult for the Fed to maintain its independence from the Treasury, and the Treasury really pressured the Fed into a favorable rate environment to finance war bonds. Mariner Eccles, again, thought that winning the war was more important than Fed independence, but at a certain point, it became difficult for the Fed to regain control of monetary policy, and inflation around the Korean War became a problem. So an important agreement was struck in 1951, the famous, among central banking um, fans, the famous Fed Treasury Accord, basically was an agreement between the two institutions that the Treasury wouldn't pressure the Fed anymore in maintaining this favorable rate environment to help the Treasury. Now, fast forward to 2010, and we've seen, after all this time, a gradual erosion of this barrier that had built up over time, again, between the separation of monetary and fiscal, and this custom and law separating Treasury pressure from the Fed. Okay, oh, there it is. Sorry, I do need to find my mouse here for a second. Do you know how I can get it back on the screen? Let's see. Um, all right, so here we are. I just need to figure out. Just marinate on all of this history I'm giving you here. <laughs> all right. This one. Okay. To be continued. I'm good. All right. So picking up. What happened in 2010 that was a watershed moment for Fed Treasury 
relationships. Well, the creation of the Financial Stability Oversight Council is really significant here. So Title I of the Dodd-Frank Act created a new body, an interagency council of regulators called the Financial Stability Oversight Council, or the FSOC. And this institution, this regulatory council, is helmed by the Treasury Secretary. Now, among its various powers, the FSOC can make recommendations to the regulatory agencies that are members, including the Fed, about what to do about financial stability risks. And consider for a moment how it's playing out in regard to climate change. So in 2021, the president issued an executive order instructing a whole of government approach to climate change and directed the Treasury Secretary as the chair of the FSOC to make sure that all of the member agencies were taking climate into consideration in developing their policies and programs. So in response, the FSOC made a recommendation to the Fed to adopt a number of supervisory practices, the subtext of which was that the FSOC and the Treasury thought it advisable for the Fed to undertake supervisory policies that would affect the incentives of banks lending to brown companies. So big picture, if this effort is successful, what we have here is the FSOC as an avenue for the president to influence the allocation of credit in the economy toward politically favored sectors and away from politically disfavored sectors, all while using the veneer of Fed independence, sort of washing this action through the Fed. Now the third and final case study I want to walk through with you is the Fed's forays into foreign affairs. So especially today, I couldn't discuss politics and the law of the Fed without discussing Russia's invasion of Ukraine and how central banks have been implicated <coughs> in these measures. As the conflict with Ukraine escalated over the past two weeks, the focus of US, e EU, and UK politicians was very much so on the power of central banks to exert economic warfare on Russia's central bank and the Russian banking system. <coughs> so there were two key measures that were central to these allies' economic sanctions program, and when they were announced, they really put central banks front and center. So one focused on the foreign currency reserves of the Russian central bank. So the plan was to have the US and European central banks freeze Russia's foreign reserve holdings so that the Russian central bank couldn't sell its war chest of foreign reserves for rubles to prop up the falling currency. The second measure was that the central banks got together to kick the Russian banks off of SWIFT. And SWIFT is a payments messaging system that allows for the processing of international payments. Now these moves were repeatedly referred to at, by commentators as the weaponization of monetary policy and payments infrastructure. And without a doubt, this is a political use of a central bank to address a political problem. The Treasury, the Treasury is at the helm, taking directions from the White House. So this begs a question, which is how does this fit in to the notion that central banking should not be a tool of the political branches and the Treasury specifically? So I want to explain to you that this is very much uncharted territory. And it's interesting to put it in the context of a few quick examples of how the Fed has in the past forayed into foreign affairs and how in the past the Fed has been pressured by the Treasury or general political goals to help foreign governments, but has never been pushed to weaponize its powers. So in the 1920s, an interesting example is that the Fed used interest rate policy to help the UK return to the gold standard. The world had briefly gone off the gold standard, but soon thought it a sort of moral imperative, a, a mark of national character to be able to return to the gold standard. And the president of the New York Fed at the time was a close personal friend of the governor of the Bank of England and took it upon himself to lower the discount rates in order to help the UK return to the gold standard. There was nothing in the for, for, uh, Federal Reserve Act supporting this. It was merely a matter of personal relationships and foreign affairs. Second, the Fed has used swap lines, which are essentially a swap of dollars for foreign currency that effectively act like unsecured loans to foreign governments. The Fed has used these since the 1960s to counteract so-called disorderly market conditions and really ramp them up in 2008 and 2020 for the much more overt political goal of helping the dollar remain the reserve currency of the world and supporting euro dollar markets. Again, in both of these cases, legal authority extremely gray. The Fed has also been engaged in something called warehousing currency for the Treasury to help the Treasury amplify its own foreign currency interventions. So the Treasury has something called a slush, something that works like a slush fund and it's called the Exchange Stabilization Fund. 
And on occasion, the Exchange Stabilization Fund has in fact made stabilization loans to foreign governments outside of the congressional appropriation process. In one occasion, it pressured the Fed to assist the Treasury in this endeavor in the so-called Mexican peso crisis in 1994. So, big picture, without getting into too much detail of each of these examples, we want to sort of try and understand what is this history and grayness in the law tell us about the Russian measures. Does it say anything about the future of central banking and politics? Now, I'm not so sure. I think, in this case, we've entered the territory of a treasury override that seems to implicitly exist where emergency meets foreign affairs. The Federal Reserve Act does contemplate that there are very few occasions where the Treasury and the Fed's jurisdiction overlaps, and when that happens, the Treasury can supervise and control the Fed. Now, this is a great reason for the Fed to stay out of fiscal affairs, but it also might suggest that where it's unavoidable, the Treasury has some legitimate say. The Fed is also a fiscal agent for the Treasury, so the execution of government transactions may also be legally consistent with the Federal Reserve Act. And constitutionally here, the Article II power of the presidency looms large, as the president has plenary power in matters of foreign affairs. So ultimately, how do we assess pol political incursions into the Federal Reserve? So I want to suggest to you that there are four reasons when we should start to worry about the commingling of politics and central banking. So the first is if we see a blurring of fiscal and monetary stands in order to increase the power of the executive branch relative to Congress. The framers of the Constitution gave Congress the power of the purse and the power to deal with the value of money, not the president. So any legislative moves to shift more power to the president to delegate that power flies in the face of what our framers envisioned for the purposes of avoiding the concentration of pecuniary power in the president. We need to make sure that the power of the purse and the sword remain separate. Second, we should ask ourselves if we have cause to worry about the legitimacy of the Fed. The Supreme Court is now routinely taken to task for attempting to act as a super legislature. It suffers a similar democratic deficit as the Fed. Its leaders are unelected. And when it departs from value-neutral decision-making, it suffers a legitimacy crisis. And third, is Treasury pushing the Fed to create new central bank reserves, new money for political goals? Because this opens the door legally to dangerous economic heterodoxy, like modern monetary theory, which depends on the ability to hand the reins of money creation power over to the president. So under these criteria, I would conclude by saying, I think perhaps we should indeed worry about climate change and other efforts to exploit, exploit ambiguity in the Federal Reserve Act for political goals, but the Russian conflict doesn't clearly fit into that box. So Congress should continue to worry about the politics of Fed governors and be discerning about appointments, and it should also think very carefully before it gives the Fed more jobs to do and add more potentially ambiguous mandates to the Federal Reserve. Thank you. So excited to dig into all of this. Um, last but not least, Charles. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here today, to be with all of you, uh, to be online with those who are online, but also to follow such two great presentations and to have a chance to build on the themes that they developed. And the key word that I think really links all of us today is the word legitimacy. Um, as you can see, you know, do we have uh, my slides up? Or? I don't know. Maybe not. Oh, I was supposed to figure that out. Oh, there, you did. I appreciate that. Thanks. Someone has to be competent up here, and I appreciate that you are. And so um, this concept of legitimacy, I want to point out, as the two previous speakers has, is central, and it changes over time. So what I want to do is take stock of the quality of our monetary institutions right now, but specifically pointing out how much progress was made in that quality up till 2006, and then how much has changed in a negative direction since 2006. So my theme is going to be about how legitimacy 
changes in institutions. Uh, first, just to, trying to take stock of where we are, how we got there, but then also analyzing a little bit how things happen like that. Um, let's see, I am also struggling with my technology here. Let's see, oh, I think I can do it. There, I did it. Okay, so th the first point I wanna make is, not surprisingly, all of the institutions that we're talking about, not just the central bank them itself, the commercial banks that are chartered by the state, the laws that are created and the rules that govern them are all the outcome of the political process. They have to be. We're in a democracy. All institutions reflect a political process. Uh, th the question is not whether institutions are the outcome of a political process. They always are. The question is whether they are legitimate. And legitimate is a very important word. It reflects the perceptions of the citizenry that the institutions are acting in a way that's consistent with their mission defined within our democracy to achieve particular objectives rather than acting capriciously, arbitrarily, or to favor particular people over others. And so legitimacy is a key word. It hasn't been defined yet, so I want to try to define it as the perception of the citizenry that the institutions are working for some bona fide public purpose. That's really what uh, you want in your institutions. And you might say, well, how can politically created institutions do that? And the answer is, it isn't that hard. I mean, it's not trivial, but we have made an enormous amount of success in taking political constructs and ensuring that they are legitimate. And yet, it's also fragile. And that legitimacy can go away. So we want to try to understand everything's always political, but sometimes it's legitimate and sometimes it's not. How does that happen? So let's start with where all these institutions come from. I would say I would start in Italy about um, in the 16th century because it was two things that made politics want to create all these institutions. One of them was the interest of merchants and the other was the interest of the state. The interest of the state mainly having to do with fighting wars, being able to place its debt, being able to manage its finances, and the interest of merchants wanting to have trade occur conveniently for them. And of course, having a good medium of exchange, a stable value of money was important to both of those. I won't go through all the details of that <coughs> theory, but I think it's pretty clear. And, and so uh, as things evolved, we got all of these institutions coming out of the sort of evolving understanding of the informed interests of citizens and the government itself to create monetary institutions to serve their, their purposes. Again, I want to emphasize, there's no banking without politics. Okay, so I want to emphasize, when we construct institutions to achieve this purpose, it has a lot of different dimensions. And so I'm just going to divide those into five or four dimensions and then give a progress report up to 2006. One of them has to do with setting up institutional barriers that divide responsibilities. We've heard all about this already from prior panelists. So this ensures accountability. That's if you don't have boundaries, there can't be accountability. It makes each of the institutions, let's say in this case the Treasury, the Fed, or different aspects, regulatory authorities other than either of those, to focus on their tasks. So for example, up until 2006, at that point, we had, we had a, 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 a practice which was that the Federal Reserve conducted monetary policy primarily through open market operation purchases of treasury bills or sales of treasury bills. The Fed simply confined itself to treasury bills. The, that meant that the Fed had nothing to say about the maturity structure of the debt the government issued that was held by the public. In fact, the Treasury had authority over that. So it was, it was clear that the Fed was accountable for inflation, for the stock of money and how to exchange Treasury bills for money, and the Treasury was accountable for what should the maturity structure of the debt be that's held by the public. Two completely different things. That's no longer true. I'll come back to where we are in a minute, but just to, to emphasize, that was not a coincidence. That was actually an intentional rule that was created to divide responsibility to ensure accountability. 
if you thought that debt management wasn't being done properly, you knew who to blame, the Treasury. If you thought that inflation was in excess, you knew who to blame, the Fed. Uh, and of course, there were also rules and procedures established that ensured that people understood the process that was governing these things. This goes back really to the uh, Bank of England. Um, the Bank of England was a monopoly bank. It was established by the Whig Party in Britain. And people were very suspicious of whether it would exert favoritism in deciding whose bills to accept and on what terms. And so it was required, the Bank of England couldn't have survived as that institution if from the very beginning it hadn't developed rules that were credible to outsiders that ensured non-favoritism. And so that was part of what made the Bank of England successful as a, as a bank, being able to develop those rules. And of course, this story I'm telling you is one of institutional evolution following these principles. And then using your policy frameworks in a way that grounds your policy so that you don't just say, well, I woke up this morning and decided to print more money. You wake up and say, uh, as you know, given what I've been saying all along, given the rules we've established today, given that this is what the environment we're facing, this is the action that follows from that. And even though the Fed didn't articulate uh, mathematical rules, people had a very clear understanding that they could track, and that's where the Taylor rule came from. You may have heard of it. It's a monetary policy rule that was initially intended simply to describe what the Fed was doing, and it worked very well, meaning the Fed was behaving quite regularly from about 1990 until 2002. The Taylor rule gave a very clear, very simple arithmetic expression, gave a very clear tracking of what the Fed was doing. And then there's a governance system, very important. And the Fed had credibly established a governance system that divided power across various constituencies, Washington versus business constituencies and local district, made sure it was decentralized. So, and, and we saw visibly that the power was not all in one entity. How did we see that? Dissenting. We saw presidents in the Fed dissenting frequently, even governors at the Fed dissenting, which showed us that our process was working to create real diversity of thinking. By the way, that hasn't happened in a very long time. Now, the progress was imperfect. I could talk about the fact that we hadn't gotten there in a few respects. We had some effective, what I would call through regulation, effective fiscal actions by the Fed acting through its regulatory powers to cause some parties to be advantaged and some to be disadvantaged. We had a lot of things uh, that weren't perfect. The lender of last resort rule was never really articulated by the Fed, but still we had some limits on those things. But more importantly, those two things I just mentioned were both under active discussion as of 2006. And in fact, in 2007, 2008, just before the financial crisis, the Treasury had drafted a white paper for major institutional reform to create more boundaries and to change the regulatory powers of the Fed to depoliticize the Fed to improve on some of these things. So it was really interesting. If you, if you go back to 2007, and I'm old enough to remember 2007 very well, 2007 was not just a moment where we had achieved a lot, but where, where the warts that remained were being actively discussed and where it looked like we were about to make progress on them. By the way, Ben Bernanke and, and Rick Mishkin, who were at the Federal Reserve Board, published a book around 2000 all about how we needed to create more quantitative-based rules for monetary policy. Of course, then they got onto the, the Fed, and then the crisis hit, and everything changed in terms of their advocacy. Go back and take a look at the book. So the point is, as of about 2006, there's a pretty good consensus of how we create institutions for legitimacy. We actually were there, largely, and we had an agenda of additional items to, that we were going to do that would have worked. Now, where are we? So where we are is catastrophic from the standpoint of all that success. So the Fed is basically operating today not as a, a bank, a, a central bank that holds uh, treasury bills, but as almost what I would call a state-owned bank from a developing country. That is, it doesn't just own government securities, it owns mortgage-backed securities, it buys municipal bonds, it does all sorts of other things. Um, for example, it decides to pay above market interest rates on the interest on reserves, even though that's contrary to the statute that authorized the payment on reserves. Um, it decides when, it, when it's worried about the financial health of the money market mutual fund industry to pay 
to make sure that interest rates that they're getting are sufficiently high. The Fed is basically acting as more of a fiscal authority than a monetary authority now. And furthermore, it's holding a mix of Treasury securities of all maturities. So who's in charge of the maturity distribution of the Treasury debt held by the public? Is it the Treasury who decides what, what's, which debts to issue, or the Fed who decides which of those issued debts the public gets to hold? And the answer is, we don't know. Uh, furthermore, Hal Scott, in this first bullet point here, wrote a, a paper about how during the uh, COVID crisis, some of the programs that were supposed to be jointly administered by the Fed and the Treasury, nope, Hal argues, were actually not administered very well because the boundaries of responsibility weren't very well drawn. So even on the emergency side, there were lots of mistakes. And the problem is we don't have well-defined boundaries in terms of function or mission or process. The Fed's regulatory and supervisory powers, which I want to emphasize, are inherently fiscal powers. As if you decide to tell someone what they can and can't do or who they have to give a loan to, you're basically taxing and transferring. And those powers have exploded. Just to make matters, in case you were, thanks, in case that you were sufficiently depressed, I'll, I'll talk about how weak their tools are now. The Fed has removed, as of 2020, removed all reserve requirements and now pays interest on reserves. So reserves are pretty much the same as Treasury bills. Many economists are now writing that in an environment with zero required reserves and with interest on reserves close to Treasury bills, when the Fed actually engages in open market operations to try to shrink or expand the money supply, it probably won't have much of an effect because you can't exchange Treasuries for reserves and have an effect if they're the same thing. So um, we're, we're now, I would say the Fed, uh, the people governing the Fed don't really, at the board, aren't great monetary economists. In fact, some of them, I would say, don't seem to know much about monetary economics. Um, the, the governance issues have become a sham. So we now see the Fed board is supposed to have an oversight approval of Fed presidents that are appointed. They've been actually telling the, the local Feds, the regional Feds, who they must appoint as their president. They're abusing their oversight authority in that way. Um, we can talk about why they've been able to get away with it. It's quite interesting. So let me just go to my last slide. So how, how did we get here? Because that's interesting. We made all this progress, and then it all went away. And when will it come back? And so I think I know the answer. I think you have to start with the crisis. If you go back to Professor Binder's uh, statement, I, I wrote it down when you said it, that to, to really cause people to change from their politically driven objectives, you need conviction of distress in the community. And what that means is what happens to make things change is a crisis. When a crisis happens, people stop worrying about long-term quality of institutions, they worry about short-term Who's going to get the money? How do we fix it? And then once there's been the, the devolution of the quality of the institutions in the name of the myopic short-term uh, needs, we also see that then we get opportunists that come in, often in the administrative state, the Federal Reserve System, to grab more power. And they, it's not just a coincidence that the institutions decline in quality. They decline because people want to grab more power. And politicians see advantages, too, in politicizing those institutions. And they don't see it much advantages in protecting them. I remember when President Trump was elected, I called someone I knew who was a, had a job of a staffer in the White House, and I said, well, this is a golden opportunity to put the Fed ship back right on track. You have a lot of appointments. You can appoint people. Let's have a clear mission to reestablish our institutions. It just wasn't a priority. Uh, he had other priorities, and therefore, he made trade-offs to appoint people to the Fed for whatever reason, but not, not because that was a high priority. And then you contrast that with, well, when was the last time we had a president who really prioritized improving the institution? And that was Jimmy Carter. So Jimmy Carter, why? Uh, he appointed Paul Volcker. When he appointed Paul Volcker, remember, we were in a situation like where we're going to be in probably a couple of years, very, even higher inflation than we're experiencing now, but th here's the good news. When things get really bad, the conviction of distress in the community, when that happens, then 
the politician in charge realizes that he, he or she has to prioritize, and that's when institutional quality gets restored. So I, I remember when Volcker was appointed, Carter was informed by Volcker what he was going to do. Volcker said, you want to appoint me head of the Fed, I just want you to know, I'm going to make you very unpopular. I'm going to, I'm going to fight inflation, and it's going to cause a recession, and people aren't going to be happy with you. And to, to Carter's credit, he still appointed Volcker. But I don't think he did it selflessly. He may have. But I think he did it also because he had to. It was, we now had a crisis of inflation. So that all of our institutions were destroyed by the crisis of the financial crisis and further by COVID, but mainly the financial crisis. What will resurrect them? The crisis of inflation, nothing else. And so the good news, bad news is, I think that's about to happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. We covered so much ground here. I'm so excited for this conversation. So um, I want to start, Charles, where you left off. Um, and I, I kind of want to make sure that I home in on the different points that you all are making. So uh, obviously, Charles, you were saying that you have an issue with, with quantitative easing, with the, the, the way that the Fed buys treasury securities and the fact that it buys mortgage-backed securities. But I want to kind of set that aside for a second and focus on what happens in 2020, which is the Fed's emergency lending. Um, and you know, you had mentioned municipal bonds, which technically the Fed does have a separate authority to buy municipal bonds, but basically what it bought recently um, was, was as a result of its emergency lending authority. So I'm curious how you all feel about what happened in 2020, and I kind of want to frame it around what Christina was getting to, which is this notion of, of legal legitimacy, because the Fed clearly has, you know, emergency lending authority, and then on top of that, there was, you know, the CARES Act, where Congress passed this law that asked the Fed to do these things. So I'm, I'm sort of curious where you draw the line between um, things that are, are politically problematic because they're what a central bank shouldn't do, and things that are politically problematic because Congress hasn't given direction. So uh, it's kind of a broad question, but I don't know, Charles, if you want to take a crack at it. Um, I think that's a really important point, because it, at least as I'm hearing it, is linking my definition of legitimacy and Christina's. That is, where does the citizens' views of legitimacy come from? In part, it has to come from seeing the rule and seeing whether you're, you're abiding by it. Um, so I think that what, what we've also learned from the, I'll just say this, let others respond. What we've learned is that during crises, rules get bent. That's happened since the very beginning of our republic. Um, and so when we decided to go into having the Fed do quantitative easing and work, go away from a, a bills only policy and go into these other areas, as part of crisis management, I supported it. The problem was that the crisis is over and we don't, we don't fix it. We don't, we don't go back to the norm. And, we, and, and that was a case where it wasn't actually a law, it was a norm. That is, the Treasury bill's only policy was not a law, it was a norm. And I would say that you have to remember too that here's a really puzzling fact. When the Fed was initially created, it was prohibited from purchasing US government securities. <laughs> it was the only World War I where the Fed was allowed to participate in US government securities uh, as collateral and then eventually in open market operations. And the reason was that they were worried that, about the politicization of the, of the Fed with the Treasury. So it's funny, some of these rules uh, have changed over time. I think the norm is more important than the rule in this case. The norm had been established of a bills only policy. And it wasn't the law. And I think it was important. And then we just acted like it never existed after 2008. Right. And, and I would add that like, as norms change and as central banks push on the, the bounds of their legal legitimacy, then they're, they're likely to more emphasize their um, so-called democratic legitimacy that, well, we have, it's legitimate for us to do these things because it's kind of the will of the people. And um, Professor Calamiris had mentioned accountability, right? That's why you need se separation of what's the role of the treasury, what's the role of the Fed. But I think we've, we've lost sight of the notion of accountability or, or don't really 
clearly think about what is accountability, and it's getting confused with responsiveness. Um, Dr. Skinner had said, like, well, Congress is our most democratically responsive institution, um, but are they that responsive these days? A lot of people would feel like that Congress is not responding to them, um, to their needs, to, to their interests, and it's sort of easier to get things done through the Fed because it is more responsive. And that's why, even though the Fed is accountable to Congress, if you were to listen to Fed speeches, you would think, well, the Fed is accountable directly to the public. And they've, they've changed their communication strategy so much over the last few years to say, oh, you know, now we're doing a better job of communicating with the public. We're going to talk, talk with the public. And I think it's, I mean, it's great for them to be transparent and for the public to be able to evaluate what they're doing and, and understand what they're doing, but I don't think that that is what it's about. I think a, a big part of their communication with the public is more about saying, like, we're responsive, mm -hmm. therefore we are legitimate and we're worthy of this discussion and this, um, these, these broader norms about what we can do. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that was just said. I'll, I'll just sort of emphasize one or two points. So one of the points was one that Professor Calamaris just raised, which was, you know, there's there needs to be a distinction that's well understood between so-called wartime measures and peacetime measures. And I think that's an important part of legitimacy, that the public generally understands that certain measures like quantitative easing, for example, or I mean, street lending facilities, right, the extent to which these are crisis era measures, but has to know that the Fed will be able to exercise its self-restraint to take the off ramp as soon as practicable. And I think that was one of the major problems of legitimacy with quantitative easing, because it lasted too long, and there were no sort of ex ante defined rules for when the Fed and other central banks, for that matter, like the Bank of England, would take their foot off the gas and taper. And this ties into you know, a theme that the other panelists mentioned too about the importance of a rules-based regime. You know, a rules-based regime is important for monetary discipline in multiple ways, one of them for sort of the general exercise of monetary policy, but also too for the use of these crisis era tools, including now the use of these non-conventional tools that can very easily you know, slip from emergency to peacetime and then from monetary to fiscal. Can I just add one sentence about that? Um, I teach a, a case in my class at Columbia on the taper tantrum of 2013. If you remember, that's when the, Ben Bernanke gave a speech and people sort of over uh, interpreted this as that quantitative easing was coming to an end. It caused a, a fairly significant international dislocations. Um, when The way I teach that, I ask the students, is there any way that you could avoid when the Fed wants to start thinking about contracting that they would cause a crisis? And the answer is no, because the Fed never even gave an indication what would be the circumstances under which it would go on that off ramp. And so if that means we can't be looking at data and trying to figure out, oh, it looks like you know they'll be going on the off ramp soon, so we better start getting ready for it. You can't prepare yourself for it because there's no norm, there's no rule, there's no even implicit understanding in a speech of what the conditions will be for removing it. When they put it on, they never said anything about that. And just recently, we're in complete chaos again because when they came up with their new policy framework, which as far as I can tell is unintelligible, they said, well, we're not going to do anything to sell these instruments. And then just a few weeks later, one of the presidents of, of the, the regional Fed said, I think we need to revisit that. And so what are our current expectations, just today sitting here, about what are going to be the circumstances that are going to lead to the Fed ending uh, the, the balance sheet expansion? Nobody has a clue. They haven't even given us a clue. Well, so wait, I just want to follow up on that for a second to make sure I understand what you're saying. Um, so the, the Fed in 2013, as you were saying, had what people called open-ended QE, right, where they were just buying and they didn't say exactly when they were going to stop. This time around, they did actually lay out criteria, and they actually have now stopped, as of like this week, actually. But um, I'm... The question is whether they'll so, sell... So I'm, I'm curious the, whether you no, think... The question is not whether... I'm sorry, let me clarify. The question is whether they'll also sell things that are on their balance sheet. Right, right, so reversing. And, yeah. and so, if, okay. for example, we, we're suffering from a major acceleration of inflation. We are gonna need them to do that. They've committed not to do it, and then 
but they've also had some of the members of the Fed say, well, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't have committed to that. So it, it's, it's very unclear how inflation problems, as they accelerate, will translate into Fed actions with respect to their balance sheet, because the Fed has, has given mixed signals, initially saying it wouldn't do anything, and now saying, well, gee, maybe we'll have to. So we, we don't really have a sense. We don't just need a mathematical formula. We just need kind of like, how do we think about how we'll use possibly sales? So I'm just giving that as an, a, 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 you're right. I wasn't saying that they, they, they didn't make an announcement about continuing to grow it, but it's already like huge. And in my view, they're going to have to face the tough decision of when to start making, partly because as I said, they've, they've got themselves into a position with zero required reserves and interest on reserves at market or above market rates, that basically I think they're going to find that their open market operations are very weak. And so they're going to have to do a lot more open market operations to move the needle on interest rates than they think they're going to. Um, so we have so much ground here. So I'm going to I'm going to switch to the the financial stability uh, piece of this because Christina, I, I thought it was fascinating when you were talking about how there isn't necessarily a, a totally clear. Uh, financial stability mandate legally for the Fed. And it's interesting because, you know, the Fed has its, its monetary po policy part of its job and then it has its bank regulatory part of its job. And then, as you were saying, basically the, the F Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is sort of this uber council, can put other companies under the Fed's jurisdiction. So I guess my question is, do you think it makes sense to have an agency that's in charge of financial stability, and do you think that it makes sense for that agency to be the Fed and that Congress should give it that mandate and lay it out, or do you think that that is, you know, just adding to too many jobs, too many mandates to the Fed? That is a great question. That is a really excellent question. So I guess we'll start by giving the room a little bit of a little bit of additional context. So in the US, as I was describing in my in my talk, in the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010, Congress created this separate institution we call macro prudential authority, right, in charge of financial stability, right? And it's supposed to scan the horizon looking for financial stability risks, identify them, and then suggest to the primary regulator what they can do about it. The other power it has, as Victoria mentioned, is that it can designate non-bank financial companies as systemically important and then port them over into the Fed's jurisdiction. So you may remember companies like MetLife, GE, Prudential, the big insurers, they were all initially designated as SIFIs. Those designations went away, but that was an example of how the power was used. Meanwhile, you have the Federal Reserve that didn't get an express responsibility from Congress to do those things that the FSOC does, right, to decide for itself what is a new financial stability risk. But it sort of fell into one and, and implied one for itself for a couple of reasons. I think one, because it's historically acted as lender of last resort, and implicitly that's a financial you know, stabilizing role. And then in the Dodd-Frank Act, because it had the Fed doing these things to ensure that big banks would be, remain stable, you know, the Fed sort of inferred that it also has this financial stability mandate that has grown over time. The Bank of England has a totally different model, a model along the lines of what Victoria was just asking me, which is that the parliament gave the Bank of England the express responsibility for financial stability, so it has the mandate in its constitutive legislation, and it also has a version of what the FSOC is inside the Bank of England. It's called the Financial Policy Committee. Okay, so it has sort of option B. And people have gone running around the horses about sort of which model is better, right? Our model is more politicized for the reasons that I told you, because it's a political body making decisions about financial stability that then ultimately does affect the Fed's perimeter, right, and potentially some of its supervisory actions, whereas the Financial Policy Committee is in theory less political because it's inside of an independent central bank. I suppose that I, if the Fed is going to do financial stability, I would prefer that Congress explicitly ask it to do so because of the accountability reasons that Professor Calamiris was laying out. If you don't have an express mandate and some clearly defined parameters around that mandate, well, you wind up in the place that we are now where the Fed is just inferring it, no one's pushing back, and yet Congress doesn't really know what it's supposed to be overseeing. So I guess that would be the answer to my question. I'm not exactly sure we can put the genie back in the bottle at this point. So maybe at this 
juncture, it's better for the Congress to be clear about what it thinks the Fed can and cannot do and what it thinks its relationship is here in regard to the FSOC and the, and the financial stability work that it's doing. I just want to agree with that. that in fact, I've specifically argued what you just said, that if, if you're, financial stability is a cyclical issue, so it's, it's monetary policy. You can't have the right hand and the left hand moving in opposite directions and have any accountability for the outcome. So if the Fed is, is our cyclical manager of monetary policy, they should be our cyclical manager of other financial stability requirements that are related to that cyclical objective. But I would add to the answer, you, you need to give more guidance on what should guide you, what are, what are your tools for that, and what is going to guide it. Um, and I think that that's a bit even more important than who makes the decision, is trying to give more specificity to what tools we're going to use and under what circumstances to, get, to make it more legitimate. Um, we're getting some audience questions here, but I do want to ask Carola first. Um, you know, you, you mentioned, or your entire presentation was about this, the Second Bank of the United States and why it ultimately fell apart. So I'm curious why you think the Fed was able to keep existing, whether you think that it was able to sort of um, establish its political independence in a way that, that made it stronger, particularly coming out of, you know, the, the Fed Treasury Accord and all of that. Uh, sure. So one thing is that the, the Fed, well, the first and second bank of the United States had 20-year charters, and from what I understand, that was because of mm -hmm. some of the founders' beliefs that um, each generation should be able to sort of pick its own institutions and that that would give them legitimacy, and so that, hence the 20-year charters, which in both cases were not renewed. The Fed also, um, you know, it started with the with 20-year charter, but it was um, renewed in perpetuity, um, shortly before the, the Great Depression, so it's, you know, fun to think about whether that would have still happened uh, a couple years later. But, um, but then why, so why has the Fed, why did, why did the Fed kind of improve in its independence um, over those decades, um, over the post-war decades? Um, I think it, it was a, a ver a couple of different things. I mean, it, it was a matter, partly luck, partly good decisions. Um, the Fed was, so they have what they call this transparency revolution, right, where um, they realize, okay, we rely on our credibility in order to be legitimate. What is credibility? It's doing what we, it's people seeing that we do what we say we're gonna do. And so to have credibility, we need to be more transparent and that'll also give us um, more democratic legitimacy. And so they became more transparent, you know, not making their monetary policy decisions so secretive um, and communicating more with the public. And they, they continued doing that um, in the years leading up to the Great Recession. They, um, and those improvements in their communication and in their transparency, I think, did help um, preserve them as an institution. Um, it's just now, I think, the, tra the transparency um, and the communication for credibility, it's not working in the same way because, you know, like my co-panelists have said, they're not telling us what it is they're promising to do. So how then can we evaluate whether they're actually doing it? They didn't tell us what conditions they're gonna use to decide when to taper. So how can we evaluate whether they did what they said they were going to do? Um, you know, I think there's not really a risk uh, that the Fed is going to be abolished, like the second bank, because it, it ha it's, it's just almost inconceivable, and it's such an old institution and, and such a powerful one. Um, but it could be that we have politicians working through the Fed, through you know, politicizing it, rather than abolishing it so that then they can um, do monetary policy the way they would prefer. I would just add to that that um, I agree with everything that Professor Binder said, and, and I think if you look at the history of the Federal Reserve, it is the case that the Fed's legitimacy has ebbed and flowed. So for example, the first you know, real test of the Federal Reserve in many ways was the Great Depression, and the Fed did a pretty poor job throughout the Great Depression because 
essentially had a misunderstanding about how the economy worked and how monetary policy fit into that. And so arguably its legitimacy sort of ebbed after that trial by fire, so to speak. And then that's why you had the, the Banking Act reforms in many ways, which is um, part of what I discussed in my remarks. And you saw some structural changes to the Federal Reserve, and you started to see more attention in Congress to pushing the Fed into an act, a more active role in managing price stability and so on and so forth. World War II, again, right, there was a, a, a bit of a kerfuffle with the Fed and the Treasury, and the independence around the Fed was weakened and only strengthened again by the Fed Treasury Accord. A couple decades later, you have stagflationary problems in the economy, and then finally Congress reforms the Federal Reserve Act to give the Fed a price stability mandate. So you see over time that the Fed sort of has struggles with its legitimacy that are tied to its policy efficacy in many ways, and then you see sort of uh, pressure for reform, and it's part of, I forget the quote that you mentioned, but right, it's like part of this bubbling, this effervescence around periods of economic distress where we then look to reforming and improving our institutions. I think the issue now, though, to really recognize is the Fed is so much more powerful than it ever was in these previous decades when it had previous struggles with its legitimacy. So a legitimacy crisis at the Fed now has much more wide-ranging implications for society and the economy more broadly. Um, so I'm gonna start getting some audience questions here. Um, so one of the questions is whether it's actually possible for the Fed to be completely independent of politics. It says, Two mandates of the Fed are price stability and full employment. Can these be achieved without social stability, e.g. emergency lending in March 2020 and pressure to intervene in Ukraine and Russia conflict because of oil price hike that would lead to even higher inflation? Second question is, is the Fed's political independence good? Well, I'd like to take a, a crack at that. So um, let me start with the last one as a, as a launching point. We, we're a democracy. We don't want the Fed to be a dictator. So in that sense, we don't want the Fed to be independent of the will of the people or independent of the government. The Fed has to act according to the legislation that, that defines its mission and tells it what legitimate processes to engage in. So the Fed isn't independent of the government in, the, in that sense. The government should and control the Fed. But what it, when, when people talk about independence, in my view, usefully, what they're really talking about is independence from the current administration's objectives, wills, dictates. So that you, you're, you're still subject to the will of Congress and the president to pass legislation, and, you better, and you're appointed by them, and you, your mission is given by them, and you're gonna be held accountable, we hope, if, if they can define that mission. But you're supposed to be independent from the short-term, myopic, current administration's dictates. That is the, that's, that's the, what I would call correct in, interpretation of what useful independence is. And it's useful mainly because, it, in theory, it avoids the monetary authority chasing the electoral cycle. Um, the, you know, famously, um, Alan Greenspan uh, supposedly promised um, the Secretary of the Treasury under the George H.W. Bush administration <clears throat> that he would not tighten going into the election of 1992. And, and that was why George H.W. Bush changed his tax position. The read my lips changed was based on, according to the Secretary of the Treasury, a promise that Greenspan made that if he increased taxes, Greenspan would promise not to tighten and then Greenspan, according to the Secretary of the Treasury, who was bitter about this to the end, very, very upset about it, then backed out on that promise. But that was, okay, so you might even say Greenspan wasn't very honest, but he was acting independently, right? He had a meeting with the Secretary of the Treasury, promised him something, and then said, ha, 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 too bad. I got the tax increase I thought was good in my argument with you, and then there's nothing you can do. That is. It might be a little sleazy, actually, but that is real independence. It's not being independent from the government in some medium or long-term sense, though. Yeah, on the Fed's uh, website, they describe themselves as independent within government, not independent of government. Mm -hmm. But I think, they're, uh, yeah, the independence, um, 
of the Fed, it's, it's a good thing in the sense that central banks all around the world, they always face political pressure, and it's almost always to loosen policy, not to tighten it, because a bit of looser monetary policy in the short run you know, strengthens the labor market and helps politicians get reelected. So without central bank independence, um, you would have an inflation bias in policy. So that's like the, the theoretical, you know, reason for, for laws that gave central banks more independence in the past decades. Um, the de jure and de facto independence don't always go together. So you still, you know, have some central banks facing very um, strong laws giving them independence, uh, yet they still face and succumb to a lot of pressure um, to to do looser monetary policy. You know, when the when the president um, wants them to. And I think one of the questions was just, can you have uh, can you have a central bank? Uh, can you have monetary policy outside of politics? And you really you really can't because there's always that tension, right? People, people um, politicians would always prefer you know, in the short run, some looser monetary policy. So there's always going to be politics and central banking. Um, you could think, the only way I can imagine not having politics in monetary policy is like a gold standard without a central bank, right? You don't need, and that's like the sort of ultimate and, and really, really rules-based where, where there's, there's no even need for a central bank. You just say the dollar is worth this much gold and that's the rule. And, and we're ready to redeem dollars for this much gold. So that would, but that I think that would have its problems too. That's probably too much to get into um, <laughs> right now. But that's like one way you could imagine what would it take to get politics out of it. Um, that's a really extreme way to do it. Uh, but you could you could imagine intermediates in between full discretion and something like that. Um. Christina, did you want to say something? Oh, yeah, I'll just add quickly. So, so yeah, I think there's kind of a couple of different issues bundled into the question. So, to me, the emergency facilities and the sort of new, the development of new ones that Congress asked the Fed to do and CARES, and the other example with intervening in Russia, don't to me present problems to the Fed's independence, per se. I mean, they, it presents in interesting questions about an enlarged role for the central bank in society, potentially, and in markets, but not necessarily for its independence. The, the true sort of hallmark of independence, I completely agree, is whether or not the Fed is sufficiently distanced from the political agenda of the presidency. Um, and I think the truest threat to independence is when the Fed leadership, either itself or succumbing to pressure internally or externally, distorts its mandate so that it can accomplish items on the executive branch agenda that it doesn't otherwise have the legislative authority to do. And so I would put the examples that were mentioned outside of that category, but they certainly do pose interesting questions about how the Fed is used. If I can just say one thing, we're all talking about monetary policy. I think there is no legitimate argument for independence of the Fed in regulatory policy. Regulatory policy is a fiscal responsibility of the administrative state that should be vested in the executive. And furthermore, uh, you know, I think that we, we have a lot of reason to believe that the Fed has abused its uh, authority for, and, and can be manipulated politically. And I just want to add, once you get into regulatory policy, you start seeing Congress being able to also shape that. I won't go into the details, but there's been some really bad examples of black eyes that the Fed has acquired through making regulatory deals with members, individual members of Congress recently, which are really unfortunate. One, one quick last final word on this question. So I think like just to round out this conversation, for this very reason, this is why you do hear and see conversations from people who are, who are very concerned about Fed independence, about not adding more mandates onto the Fed, right? And even dialing back to the core of monetary policy, because the more of these inherently political jobs you give the Fed to do, the more it will be hard for the Fed to stay out of politics. And I think it's a little bit of a fairy tale to think that what happens in one side of the Fed brain is not going to implicate at all the other decisions that the Fed makes. Yes. So we got a, um, a climate question here, um, which I feel like fits nicely into what we were just talking about. Um, at what point is climate change a crisis worthy of action by the Fed, or is it the sole responsibility of Congress and the executive, even if there is political deadlock? 
So I think I can actually answer that question pretty quickly. I would say that that would be something for Congress to decide and set out for the Fed, not for the Fed to determine for itself. I um, agree. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing the rest of you all agree. Okay. Um, so there's also a couple of crypto questions here, which Carola uh, had a nice uh, <laughs> segue <laughs> to with the gold standard. Um, so it's, um, I'm going to wrap a couple of these questions here together. Um, so this person calls it an evolving threat to the idea of a centralized financial system as the use of uh, cryptocurrency, digital assets. Do you believe this threat will further politicize the role of the Fed? Will it extend the overlap between the role of Congress and the role of the thread, of the Fed, sorry? And then um, another question is, why is the Fed allowing competing cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin to exist without a fight? Uh, I, so I could jump in a little bit since ahead. I am uh, currently reading a book manuscript by Larry White called Better Currency, Fiat Money, Gold Standard, or Bitcoin, and um, in pre preparation for like a, a conference discussion that we'll have on that. So he, um, I have not got through the whole book, but he talks about competing currencies um, back in history when there were um, private mints that would compete to, to, coin, um, to coin money in the United States. And he, you know, he argues against this idea that you need to have the state as the coiner of monies and that otherwise uh, what you're just gonna get is all this fraud and you need, you know, you need, you need the state to coin, make the coins, otherwise you're gonna have these private mints that are going to you know, shave them or they're gonna be of poor, poor quality. Um, he gives a lot of examples about how you had private mints and the ones that did produce the bad quality coins with the low gold content or underweight. Um, the newspapers you know, quickly figured out which ones those were, publicized it, and they went out of business and you actually had, through the competition, you had the better um, mints with the better coins that were able to survive and it, and it was just the same kinds of market forces that, um, that you see in other industries you see in, in minting of coins too. So you can think of maybe some parallels there where, where you don't, I don't think you need to jump right away to these private cryptocurrencies are um, a threat just because they're private, right? I think there, there will certainly be financial stability concerns to think about, but as we've discussed, like, um, well, who, we need to just be careful about who's exactly responsibility we wanna make that and it, it um, but not start from the point of like, we need to rule these out because they're private. Can I, uh, so I've been working a fair amount on these questions. So I, I think it's useful to divide the world into three digital prospective currencies. One is something like Bitcoin. Secondly, the central bank's own digital prospective currency. And third, what I'll call stable coins, which already exist and are very different from either of those two. My own view is, Stable coins could evolve to be a very constructive addition um, along the lines that you were saying to our medium of exchange to preserve legitimate uh, meaning uh, for privacy and also to protect against the abuses that could come from a central bank controlled digital currency. What are those central bank abuses? Well, how would you feel about earning negative interest on your currency? Once it's digital, the next step is to outlaw paper currency, which is definitely being discussed by economists quite a bit, some very famous economists. Then, why, then what happens when you have digital currency is uh, I can actually make you pay a tax. That makes the central bank a fiscal authority in a very direct sense. So I, I think uh, there's no need, actually, there's no need for the Fed to get into the digital currency business, and it's very dangerous. Also, there's some privacy issues there about a central authority having all of our information. Um, so I think that uh, stablecoin is a better alternative than central bank digital currency by far, if it's designed properly, and if it's, um, especially if we attract stablecoin issuers into the chartered banking system, which I've written about. Bitcoin is a current uh, invention it's not a viable alternative to a pay, for a payment system. It can never be for technical reasons uh, because of its volatility, because of the difficulty in actually transacting on it on a large scale at any one moment. And so Bitcoin is like, you know, soon gonna be yesterday's story. We don't have to worry about that. The real question is, 
do we want to have private stable coins or do we want to have central bank digital currency? And I would say the right answer is we do not want to have central bank digital currency. Yeah, so I, I can be quick because the first part of my answer was essentially going to be exactly what Professor Akelamir has just said, laying out these three frameworks. And I, I agree, I think there's very little reason for CBDC and potentially some quite hefty concerns to introduce it. Um, central bank digital currency has been discussed for at least a year to 18 months now in a serious way among the leading central banks and it's very hard to discern um, point to it, frankly. Um, stable coins, on the other hand, are something altogether different, right? It changes the custom that we've come to accept that the state has a monopoly on currency. So what I'll add to this conversation is just sort of a legal constitutional point. If you look back at the original um, understanding of the Constitution and what the framers intended when they were drafting the monetary powers in the Constitution, it's not at all clear that the framers intended to give the state the power to create paper money. Um, and it's definitely not clear at all that it ever intended to give the state a monopoly over creating money. So from that perspective, stablecoin seems to sit pretty well with the original understanding of our monetary system. Um, and then the, the sort of questions that go from there is how to make it something that is reasonable from sort of an investor protection standpoint and a you know financial stability standpoint and all of those things. But um, yes, I would be quite surprised, frankly, if the Fed moved to adopt a CBDC because there is not much of a compelling case for it. Um, so <laughs> there's a question that says, if we're back in the 1970s again, who is likely to be the next Paul Volcker? Are there likely candidates <laughs> for that reformer role? I'll add, a, I'll add my own twist to that question, which is, uh, you know, we're talking about political independence. Do you think that, um, well, do you think that Jay Powell actually has sort of political support to be able to fight inflation in a way that we haven't necessarily seen before? And, and if that political support goes away, do you think that he uh, is willing to do what it takes? Let me jump in because I have a quick answer. So he just got re reappointed. So he doesn't really need the administration support directly. But on the other hand, the administration controls who will be nominated to the Federal Reserve Board, and that is something that obviously could concern him. So he, it's still part of that game that he has to play. So yeah, he does need their support, and of course is worried about congressional support too. Um, I don't think inflation's gotten bad enough, is my short answer for him to be able to rely on that support, even if he were himself interested in fighting that battle. I don't see him as a strong chairman. I don't see him as having that single-mindedness and confidence that Paul Volcker had. So I don't think he's even a prospective candidate. And I don't think, he, in the current environment, I don't think he would enjoy the support. He would have to do it in spite of opposition, likely opposition from the administration, or at least not open support. So I think it's going to have to get worse. Who is a, a candidate? We don't know. Um, you know, what we just learned from Ukraine is, if you had asked me a month ago what I thought of President Zelensky, I would have said, former comedian, jailed his opposition, uh, just maybe, I don't know, I'm not that impressed. Uh, now I have a very different view. So crises tend to help us identify people who have the stomach and the nerve to do what needs to be done in the moment. And we're not gonna know until. Um, I'll, I'll move on. Um, so another question is, how does this compare to the situation in the EU? Does the ECB face the same pressures? Is it being politicized? Why or why not? Yeah, so I can take this one. So um, the, sh the short answer is yes, a bit, yes. Um, so the ECB and the Bank of England have a different legal framework from the Fed, and I sort of gestured to this a little bit in my remarks. They have a different relationship in the following way. So the Bank of England has a primary mandate for price stability and a secondary mandate to have regard to the economic policy of the government. So that's quite different from our mandate. Our monetary policy mandate is referred to as this two-legged mandate where you've got price stability and full employment, and they're on equal footing, right? There's not a primary and a secondary mandate, and that creates some challenges for the Fed, but 
for another, another question potentially. But what this means for the Bank of England um, is that there is sort of this direct avenue for the Treasury to define for the Bank of England how it thinks about its economic policy and how that in turn should in impact monetary policy. The ECB also has this secondary mandate that allows for the importation of broader sort of fiscal governmental um, goals into the thinking of the monetary policy. Even so, right, even though there is much more of a legal legitimacy to the, Fed, uh, the Bank of England and the ECB pursuing other goals, and again, the signature issue here really is climate change, it has created some political controversy and pushback. And I'll say more so in the ECB than the Bank of England. The UK is a little bit more united in that, in the, in the sort of social consensus that that's something they want the Bank of England to do. Um, whereas in the ECB, it's, it's a little bit more challenging because there are different member states um, with different priorities and different concerns, right? So the Germans, for example, are historically very concerned with inflation and they're very concerned about the politicization of the central banking institutions. And so there's a little bit of questioning about whether Christine Lagarde's attempts to pursue climate change are politicizing the ECB. And it's definitely a live conversation, even though they have the legal framework that they could pass it off as legitimate, there is still concern that, that, that pursuing climate change will politicize the institution, although the ECB has already gone much further than the Fed. But I, I think you just hit the, the point of legitimacy again. And the ECB suffers from a legitimacy problem precisely because it's a central bank in a, a, an area of different country authority. And, and authority is not clearly divided. So I, I served on something called the uh, European Systemic Risk Board, which is the um, macro financial stability, supposedly, authority. But it doesn't really have that much power. It just um, would then be advising the regulatory authorities or the nation states about actions to take. And then the ECB shares even supervisory po uh, power over the banking system with the local government authorities. And so there's a question of when the ECB is acting, are they acting legitimately in, in their using of their powers and who, how to coordinate it. So I think that they're really actually hobbled uh, to some extent by the fact that they're not really structured in a way that has clear legitimacy. So I, I just kind of want to ask a question that gets at some of the theme of what we're talking about and some of the theme of some of the other questions. Um, you know, you all have talked about the, the Fed's research and how it's focused a lot more on non-monetary policy things. And I'm, I'm just sort of wondering because you know, if, if, we, if we do think that the Fed should be worried about financial stability, um, you know, you can imagine anything being a shock, right? You can imagine a scenario in which climate change does get bad enough where it's a financial shock. Um, and some of these other, you know, someone mentions the woke agenda, right? Um, you know, some of these other things do have relevance to what the economy looks like. So I guess what I'm curious about is, do you think that the Fed should have bounds on what it researches, or is the main issue the actual policy? You go first. Uh, yeah. I ran a research department at the OCC, so I'll, I have an opinion, but I want them to go first. <laughs> so we wrote, we wrote a paper on this. Carol, do you want to take, your, take first, and then I'll talk to you? Sure. I mean, policy is, is the most important, but the, as the Fed says, I mean, as the Fed will say its communication is part of its policy. Right? And Janet Yellen said that a lot of times, that sometimes communication is the policy. And part of what the, the research departments do is, uh, is basically public relations, it's communication. Um, now, I think sure, the Fed needs to be able to hire good research economists. And part of the way it hires good research economists is to give them a lot of flexibility to pursue their own research agendas. So I would not say, oh, you know, the Fed should not, Fed researchers should not be allowed to research this or that topic. I think um, that would, that would be, do more harm than good because we want good economists to find it an enjoyable and fulfilling place to work. Um, um, yeah, I think it's more an issue if they're really like politicizing cert certain research so that even if they're not 
doing policies, say, that address climate change, the public, who doesn't actually understand much about what the Fed is or does, gets the impression that they are, that the Fed deals with climate change. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my research is about what does the public actually even know or think about the Fed, and they, most people know very little about it, and they're not helped to know about it by the media when, for example, the Washington Post just had like an op-ed saying, we asked 12 experts what the White House should do about inflation. And you know they've found 12 experts who thought the, basically thought the White House should do, should deal with inflation, and people think that whatever inflation is, we can blame or credit the president for that. And a lot of most people probably don't know the Fed has a 2% inflation target, for example, or where the Fed gets its authority from. And so anything they you know maybe they see some research project of the Fed that's that's publicized and the ones that are publicized are gonna be the more controversial ones, so their only exposure to the Fed really is gonna be something politically controversial that then might either turn them really on or really off of the Fed. Um, yes, so exactly that. And if you're interested, so the topic of what the reserve banks are researching has been in the, in the news a lot, and so our goal in this joint work that we undertook was to a, trace the legal history of the research function to really understand where the law came from and also what the governance mechanisms were, which is pretty interesting. And if you're really interested in going in depth, you can check out the paper. And then we also did this big empirical analysis of what, in fact, the reserve banks are studying. Um, and so we don't take in that paper we don't really take a very strong normative position about whether it's good or bad that the reserve banks are doing these different things because there are obviously pros and cons. But we do suggest, again, tying into this theme of accountability and boundaries, um, we do suggest that there are potentially two problems if you want to identify a problem. And the first is that when the public misunderstands that the reserve banks don't in fact create policy, that the board does that. So to the extent that the public believes that a you know groundswell of research on climate change means the Fed is doing something about climate change, right? As um, Professor Binder was saying, that's a misperception that needs to be corrected about what the role of the Fed is. Um, and then the second thing is actually quite interesting. What we discovered in looking at the primary source documents about the research function of the Federal Reserve System is that this is not a new question, right? Concern from both Congress and members of the Fed board about the potential for reserve banks to stoke controversy through their research function has existed since the 1930s. And there are periodic memos where the board is very clear, be careful that you're not undertaking research for the purpose of trying to sway public opinion. And I think that's maybe perhaps subtle or a soft factor, but one that's sort of important, right? To the extent reserve bank researchers are taking up and issues that they want to sort of think about sort of on the horizon or forward thinking or just expanding sort of their intellectual toolkit, fine, but there's a line between research and advocacy, and I think one would be the proper domain of academia, perhaps, and the other perhaps the proper domain of the reserve banks, and um, so that's kind of where we come out on it at the end. I don't have anything to add because I like their answers so much. <laughs> Here you teased, you had so much to say. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There it is. <laughs> um, this is a fun one. What do people inside the Fed think? Do they want to play a more political role? Do they want to stay out of questions beyond their mandate? Oh, uh, I'd like to, because I have many, many friends who are researchers at the Fed, and I, I think the question's about researchers, but I'm not sure. It sounds like it is, about people that do research. Uh, I mean, I take it as kind of like the officials in general. Okay. Um, I think it, it varies. Um, I, and as somebody who's not shy, and everyone who knows me knows I'm mm -hmm. not shy, I would say that I think uh, Lael Brainerd is not doing herself or the institution any good service mm -hmm. by being so clearly partisan in her role as a governor. So she clearly wants to play a political role, maybe wants to be the next Fed chair, maybe want, wants to be the next Secretary of the Treasury. I don't know what her ambitions are, or she's running for office, but she's not behaving the way a governor should behave, in my opinion. So there's some people who clearly, through their statements, make it clear that they want to inject themselves into politics and want to take the institution down that path. I would say that the Fed presidents generally do not, 
And uh, I think that economists working as researchers there generally do not, and in fact often cringe at what's going on today at the Board of Governors because it's so contrary to what's good for the institution. I think, yeah, exactly. And I, I, you can tell a lot from the statements that the Fed governors make. So to the extent that Fed governors will respond to a question about their authority by saying that it's for Congress to decide, that is essentially code for saying that we do not believe that the Fed should be an activist institution. Um, okay, we're, we're almost out of time here. I think we have time for maybe one more. I'll, maybe I can fit in two, but um, so this one says, despite all the concerns being discussed, our economy has managed to improve since the 1950s. Clearly this system and any system can be improved and your suggestions as to existing and potential problems guide that improvement. Isn't this to be expected? I don't sense crisis simply because we need to deal with inflation. So is there, is there a really big problem here? Are these just quibbles? <laughs> I think it's a big problem. I think that, but um, it's, it's not just the inflation problem. Actually the inflation problem is the thing that's gonna help us fix, get monetary policy to be better. In fact, if we didn't have an inflation problem, we would just have this kind of uh, rudderless ship uh, of, of mistakes and overreach and unaccountability go on and on and on. So I'm actually hopeful that uh, the big problem that's coming up will help us fix the, the, the major long-term issue. I don't think it's a small cost to have one of the major locus of power in our government be so unaccountable, so misguided. I agree, I think it's a pretty significant problem. And I do, you do get the very real sense that it's, we're sort of at a turning point in the role of the Fed, right? We can fix these problems, or we can really sort of sign on to a fundamentally different kind of institution from the one that the American public agreed to in 1913, and again in 1935, and so on and so forth. And I think that, you know, there are questions that are going unanswered, right, and that are just assuming to be true in terms of the increased role of the Fed in financial markets, the increased role of the Fed in all of these sort of you know, adjacent areas under the heading of financial stability. You know, I use the metaphor of the central bank Leviathan, and I, I do think that that would be a significantly different institution, a significantly different economy. It opens the door to a really different relationship with the people and markets and the state. Right, and there's underlying larger problems, like part of the reason why we that there has been this movement to give so much more of a role to the Fed is because there has been a sense that it's impossible to get Congress to do the kinds of, deal with the kinds of real problems that we have with inequality and climate and things like that. I mean, maybe the Fed can do a better job at addressing these than Congress currently can, but that doesn't mean that the Fed should. It means we need somehow to fix Congress, if there's like underlying issues that are really big issues, they're not gonna be fixed by, by just letting technocrats do more. And, and you know, that can be like a shorter run fix, but it's just gonna increase people's sense that, um, that they're, they don't really, um, they're not really in a democracy, like they're not really getting um, a say in their policies that like technocrats are doing it for them. I can't resist making one final point, which is, look at this panel itself. Victoria, I know that you have opinions, quite good ones, uh, worth listening to, on everything that we've been talking about. But you've decided that the division of responsibility in this panel was that you were gonna make it a good panel by being the uh, moderator. And so you played that role quite well, in my opinion. Um, and that's called accountability, gives, correct division of responsibility and makes things better. So it's a great example of we're playing different roles here today. The roles could be reversed. I'm not sure I could do your job as well as you are. Uh, well, it feels, it feels a little vain to end the panel there, but. <laughs> <laughs> Take you in. <laughs> but I think that that, uh, that sums it all up quite nicely. Thank you all so much. This was a really interesting discussion. Um, seems like we got a lot of interest online, so um, thank you. Thank you so much to all of you for being here, um, and I think I'm supposed to turn it back over. <laughs>
thank you so much. That was a really fascinating discussion, very enjoyable. And I hope that that whets your appetite um, for the next one. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank all of our guest speakers and the moderator, the Tommy G. Thompson Center, and everyone who joined us both in person and virtually. Don't forget about our next upcoming events on April 1st at UW Oshkosh and April 5th at UW La Crosse. Visit the Tommy G. Thompson Center website for more information. Thank you again and have a great afternoon and a great weekend.